Welcome to the Clutter Fairy Weekly for March 3rd, 2020. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is our uh, webcast and podcast where we talk about organizing tips and tricks and strategies, and we're going to answer questions that you give us and topic suggestions that you cover and, and in all of our channels, and we appreciate that you offer them. Before we get started, I have a few quick notes for anybody joining us for the first time. If you're participating in Zoom, you can share your comments and questions in the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before we move on to the next topic. You can also use the raise hand feature to let me know that you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. We're streaming live on Facebook, so you can also share your questions and suggestions there, and I'll relay them to Gail. And during the live webcast every Tuesday, you can talk to us directly by calling 669-900-6833. Use meeting ID 993-419-863 to join the meeting. Let's get started. Um, last week, our main topic was alternatives to buying stuff. We had a lot to say on that topic, and we <laughs> ran out of time before we got to everything that we prepared. So we wanted to circle back and pick up this topic of talking about reducing the things that – reducing the clutter by re reducing what comes in. So we can all make our spaces better by letting things go, and given the volume of stuff that we're living with, this is one piece of the project is to let stuff go. But we can also change the way that we consume so we don't create so much volume to let go of later. And we've talked about overbuying food only to throw it out because it's spoiled. And we do the same thing when we overbuy stuff. I'm sure there are lots of good reasons to buy in volume part of the time, but we can always be thoughtful about trying to reduce reduce and reuse what we bring into the house to begin with instead of buying in volume. So here are the few things that you that we didn't quite get to last week that are ways that you can not buy to save money and space. So one of them that we thought was particularly clever was luggage. Um, I've been a lot of houses where there's family of four and they have pieces of luggage for everybody in the house and they always have a weekend trip small luggage set and then they have the go to europe two week set <laughs> it's <laughs> super super huge and they use that once uh you know every five years and so <clears throat> this is one of those things that keeping a set of luggage for 90 percent of the trips that you make and then borrowing a big piece of luggage from a friend when you actually need to go to europe might be worth it so that you are saving the space of and all, your whole family's big pieces of luggage stored in a closet somewhere, which are basically four big boxes that you have to store somewhere. <laughs> so that's those take up a lot of space and you might as well borrow them every once in a while instead of keeping them against that very random opportunity when you travel with a big, big box. Um, the other one we didn't cover yet was about paper shredding. Uh, there are a lot of alternatives to owning a paper shredder, and frankly, I recommend that people use these when you, if you're working on a big shredding project and you're doing a bunch of backlog of shredding, people tend to get out their little daily $100 home shredder, and they try to shred 15 boxes of paper, which overheats the motor and fries it, and you, you end up killing the shredder. And I've done that at people's houses where they insist that I shred it on site, and then we overheat the motor, overheat the motor, overheat the motor, and then it's dead, and we have to go buy another $100 shredder. So those shredders are not designed for volume, and there are so many shredding alternatives that are designed for volume, and it's worth to spend the money on this instead of going and spending the money on the second and third shredder that you're going to burn up. <laughs> so one of them is if you have a volume, you can go to a UPS store and um, pay by the volume and they will shred stuff there. Um, there are a lot of shredding businesses that their business model is that they're, you know, certified document shredders and they go to corporations and businesses where they need, um, particular certification that yes we actually destroyed these documents and so they bring the truck to the corporation and it gets shredded on site and then they can sign their certificate that it got shredded it didn't leave the property um, 
those people have figured out that there's lots of residential to be had out there, lots of residential work. And so they will, for some amount of money, come to your driveway and do the same thing that they do at big businesses. And so um, I had a client where I was emptying the attic and we ended up with 25 moving boxes worth of shredding. Now, 25 boxes of shredding densely packed, as you can imagine, is, you know, two feet tall of paper stacked. And so that's a lot of shredding. <laughs> and so the shredding truck can do 25 boxes in a half an hour where it would take you 30 hours to shred that much and probably three machines. So it's totally worth you. You're worth your time and effort to let the truck come in your driveway and let the you know strong guy with the dolly roll all the paper out, dump it up into the thing, and have it be gone in 30 minutes. And they always have a camera, and you can sit there and watch the little camera, watch the teeth chew it up in the camera. So um, totally worth investigating getting a shredding company to come to your driveway. Um, and then there's always community events, free community events, and those vary depending on who's putting them on and how close they are to you and yeah, yeah. But the, there may or may not be a donation requested. There may or may not be a volume limit. And I think that in, in an effort to make use of free shredding, often people stack the shredding in the corner waiting for the free event and then they miss the free event. <laughs> so the shredding never actually leaves the house or they accumulate 25 boxes and then the free event only wants, they only want five boxes per car, for instance. And so um, free, event, free events are a great thing to do and you should investigate what their volume is and you probably should aim for more than one free event. So don't wait with a huge pile and try to intersect with just one date and one drop off. You're gonna probably have to work a little bit harder than that. But these are all alternatives to sitting and spending hours and hours and hours shredding in your own home. And I recommend that 100 times over because <laughs> your time is valuable and it's going to take you forever to shred a big volume. Um, Ed, I need you to come back online and tell me about bicycles. What were you saying about bicycles? Um, just That's that a lot, of, a lot of cities are implementing bike sharing oh, right, right, right. Um, arrangements. In Houston, it's B-Cycle which I, you know, is, has a contract with the city to provide and maintain stations all over the inner city. They're, they're in, in um, downtown in the museum district and Montrose and I midtown think, and yeah, yeah, midtown, yeah, the, the more densely populated areas of town all have these things and um, all along the rail lines. So you can, you know, leave home, and or park park near a rail line and ride the ride the rail to one of the big museums and pick up one of these rent one of these bikes and they can you can do it by membership so that you can so you pay one annual fee or you can rent them for a few hours and um and i know i'm certain that that exists all over any place where there's a dense urban environment there's going to be some kind of some bike form. sharing yeah there are even places where they work on a free model and you have to i think you have to register in some way but then you have free access so you just need to know who checked it out and, so um, the, the point of that being on our list of um reducing and reusing is that you don't have to store you know, 15 bicycles in your garage that you that no one is using more than twice a year, there may be alternatives for you to rent bikes and have them for the day or the afternoon when it's pretty and you wake up one Saturday and it's gorgeous and it's like, oh, we should go bike and then you can go rent a bike. You don't have to be storing and trying to keep the bicycles out of the way of the cars and try, you know, blah, blah, blah. So um, it, there may be a way for you to rent bikes and not have to keep bikes in your garage. The only caveat on that is if you're a very, very tall person, you <laughs> probably will not find a bike that works very well for you. Or Since if you're the a Ed six foot four person, I think if you're a very, very small person, I, I, the stations I've seen don't usually have any children's bikes. So oh, yeah, that, yeah. You know, that's probably a, a limitation. Well, and I bet that there's, you know, there's a little bit more exposure to risks there. 
yeah. that um, you know a little kid might some liability. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I can see that. So the other thing that was on our reuse or uh, reduce list was sports equipment and camping equipment. So camping equipment is a massive collection of stuff, and unless you're a really avid camper you know, you may go camping three times in your lifetime. And if you do, it might be worth it to go, instead of investing in a bunch of equipment, go and rent that equipment from REI or somewhere else. And, you know, then turn it back in. And sports equipment, same thing, skateboards, surfboards, scooters. These are things that you can probably rent for a short period of time. And, and again, this is like, you're going to try out a new sport before you go spend all your money on the new sport. You know, oh, I've got to have new shoes. I've got to have – this is the hobbyist, equi- uh, the hobbyist equivalent of buying all the craft supplies before you know if you like the craft. <laughs> right. Try it out. Go rent the stuff before you find out whether you're going to invest all your money in that very expensive surfboard. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's our wrap-up for last week. Actually, Thank there you. was Thank one more we that. skipped. I don't think we talked – did we talk about party equipment? No. And supplies. Yeah, and that's another thing. If um, there, that kind of stuff is always available as a catering in Houston. There's a couple of stores, places, party suppliers where you can rent equipment, chairs and tables, and banquet cover. You know the table coverings. There's all sorts of uh, large party supplies that you can rent and not have to invest in them. Would be a good thing. Yeah, and right. if you have, you know, if you're going to do New Year's New Year's Eve one year, and you don't want to keep three dozen champagne flutes somewhere in your house the rest of the time, that's right. a great way and, to go. And five six foot tables, right? I mean, if you have a Super Bowl <laughs> party every year, that's there's some infrastructure that you can rent. That's a good point. Okay, now we're done with you. <laughs> now we're topic. done with that, <laughs> and let's talk about organizing in a tight space this was suggested by youtube viewer t porters one and um so we're talking it's about been a long time uh, viewer the t porters yeah. one has been watching us for a long time so thank you for the suggestion so we're talking about crowded basements attics closets that are just jam-packed full what are some ways to get started in these difficult tight spaces so I actually just watched a, a YouTube video of somebody who's working on um, implementing minimalism in her life, and she's videoing the journey as she goes through the various stages in her, um, in her, rec- her clean out. And one of them was this room where she – it's like somehow under the house or around some portion. I can't quite tell where it is, but she basically has to sit down and crawl into this space – so it's not full person height. And so she was laying down in amongst this very dense space and kind of throwing things behind her as she worked. And then she turned around and she was like, oh, now I can't get out. Like she had blocked herself in completely. So um, working in the attic uh, because you it isn't always floored up there and you have to step carefully where you put things and working in a basement. Now basements usually have a little bit more space, but uh, it's always the dumping ground. These are all the spaces that are sort of outlying storage that you jam things in so that you don't have to look at them or deal with them. And then when it's time to clean them out, it's a huge project and there's a lot in the way. So, um, <clears throat> All of those are places where I'm going to say first, you need to be really careful about your health and safety in those environments because they are um, sort of neglected spaces that who knows what's crawling around in there. And it's also not like walking around on your finished floor in your house. And so you want to be careful that you are paying attention to how you move around in the space. And like the lady that I was watching, that you don't block yourself into the space so your kids have to rescue you she had to direct her children to come and move things out of the way so she could get back out of the space so uh, (laughs) you want to be careful about your uh, ingress and egress as you work in these spaces but one of the ways that you can work in a tight space like that is to recognize that it's too that you don't really actually have working space in there and that you need to work on the project a little bit outside of that space. So 
designating a secondary location and taking things out of there and moving them to the secondary location, you know, not necessarily the dining room, but maybe you want to pop a table up somewhere and bring some things down and then work with them um, so that you're not sitting in the attic trying to work on it. Um, you can bring a few things down and work in a comfortable space. And obviously you can't empty the whole attic or empty the whole basement into a secondary space at once, but you can absolutely bring down, you know, two or three handfuls or two or three boxes, work with those, solve those problems, put that stuff in and keep and toss and whatever, and then come back and get another round. So this still applies to a closet. I mean, this is the equivalent of when you walk in a walk up to a closet and you open the door and it's packed to the wall and you can't even get into the closet anymore. Like the first thing is pull, work your way across the floor and you're pulling things off the floor. And you can do that same process in the attic or the basement. Just pull out what's easily accessible and pull that out first and work on that and just keep chipping away to pull things out. The other thing is if you have enough room to at least maneuver and reach some of the stuff, then I would focus on the easy, the easy wins and the low hanging fruit. Like here's a large piece of furniture that um, got shoved up here at some point. You might try to pull out large boxes, large pieces of stashed, whatever tables and chairs and bookshelves and that kind of stuff. Um, I knew somebody who, had a their parents had taken a file cabinet and put a file cabinet in the attic and it was a and then filled it with paper <laughs> so that one you would have to empty it obviously to move it but that is a big footprint in in the space and so uh, arranging to have that brought down would be helpful and then suddenly you have this big file file drawer shaped space that you can stand in and work from if you can get that piece out. Um, obviously, uh, sometimes you can't even get to them to get them out, but anything that you can see that is large and pull out and deal with first will create space quickly. And a lot of times, in, in particularly in attics and basements, this is where all the empty boxes go. And so if anybody is storing their empty boxes because here's the TV box and I need the TV box when I go to move 30 years from now. It's like, yeah, that's another conversation about what is the condition of the cardboard after 30 years in your attic. But either way, you probably have lots of boxes up there. Sometimes people that save boxes because they want to make sure they have a collection of boxes on hand for shipping or whatever, then they sort of default to saving the cardboard box and they throw that into the basement or they throw that into the attic. Oftentimes I find empty, a whole bunch of empty boxes in these spaces that are taking up a lot of airspace, but they're really just waiting. They're just recycling, waiting to happen. They just need to disappear. So you can make a lot of headway if you go in and pull out all the empties. And it will surprise you how many times you got to the, you took something out of the box that you just bought you thought to yourself, I need to save this box in case I decide to return it. And you go throw it in the attic or the basement, anticipating, you know, okay, after 30 days, I'm not going to return it, but you never go get the box. So 10 years later, that item that you saved the box in case you return it has been up there for a decade and you can long since get rid of it. So that one is, um, that's an easy way to make space. And it's also, you know, taking out empty boxes is not hard work. <laughs> It's and it's not a hard solution to resolve. You can just go stick it straight in recycling. So that's a good Gail, way to make space. Um, yes. Um, Bonnie said, um, never store cardboard boxes. You are just inviting a termite infestation. Ooh. And that's true. If it's in any in any uncontrolled area, you know, any any area that isn't under temperature and humidity control. Um we as we've saved some boxes for particular appliances like the th things that have styrofoam yeah the molded inserts pieces that that hold it all together um so we we saved a few of those mostly as you know when we reached the point where we knew a move was coming but otherwise yeah you're you 
cardboard is just decomposing in place. Yeah, and in um, I did a, a friend of mine in Dallas had lived on her property. They had owned the house for 25 or 30 years, and they had been throwing cardboard boxes into a particular portion of the garage for decades, and it was full, full, full. And when we started, they sort of lived in an outlying area of Dallas, out in the suburby area. And when we, I went up to help her and we went through the garage. And when I started undoing that portion of the garage, it was essentially where a car would have parked. So it was that big of a space covered in cardboard. And we started peeling it apart. And when we got down to about the last third, it just sort of like, things started running there was you know <laughs> mice field mice that had come in and made nests and there was you know roaches you could clearly and it had been that, that what had been on the bottom had been there so long it had just sort of become this decomposing shredding falling apart collection of paper and so they were clearly useless at that point and um there's no good reason to store a million boxes unless you are, you know, running a business and you're mailing stuff all the time. <laughs> like you, yeah. You know, keeping four or five boxes and in, in stopping is enough. Like that's it. Yeah. And so yeah, in Texas, it, you know, the, the paper, the cardboard and the glue that they use on the cardboard is particularly tasty to them. And so then you just sort of create, <laughs> Uh, you know, a, a buffet. <laughs> I, well, and I should say that my um, qualification about the the things we kept, we these were in a closet. We had a yeah in air the, conditioned in the air conditioned you know humidity controlled closet that had some space. Yeah. So that's the only reason we could get away with it. And I definitely don't recommend it. <laughs> I pulled out um, in, in the attic that I worked in. It was the full length of the front of the house and. Um, so the eaves were, you know, it was, it was basically against the side of the house and where the eaves were to the outside. And there was a whole collection of like dirt dauber wasps that had, were coming into the attic and they were attaching themselves to the boxes. And so I kept picking up things and seeing clumps of wasp house basically <laughs> and hoping that they were inhabited while I was working on them it was very you know Ugh! these are the, the you uh, you interact with a little bit with wildlife and uh, insects when you start working in attics and basements most of the time and mice Denise mentioned right mice, and mice, mice exactly love the old boxes yeah yeah and that was why in Dallas because they were surrounded by fields that you know it gets colder in Dallas and in the winter time the mice were like oh cool look here's an enclosed area that has some you know boxes in it I can go live and be warm like, yeah, yeah she was just making a habitat in her garage. <laughs> <laughs> so um the other thing that I want to say about working in a, or in a tight space is that um typically when we work on these projects we make piles of donation and we fill up trash bags and then we stop at the end of the work day and take all that stuff out and I think you can help yourself if you uh, stop much more frequently, make much smaller piles of here's a donation pile, and then just remove it immediately. Use small trash bags and take trash bags out more frequently because um, when it's crowded and you're in a crowded space and you're trying to work, every single thing that you take out is more airspace for you to function. So don't wait till the end to start removing things. You should be removing them all along the way and um, trying to do that more frequently. Um, what else do we have to say about that? I think that's everything. It, any kind of a tight space, it's just like working in a closet that you can't walk into. You have to pick a corner and start where you can reach and pull it out in small bits. And if you have to remove it to another area to work on it, fine. And just don't overwhelm yourself. That was the other thing I wanted to say. You don't want to pull the entire attic out into some space in your house and then not be able to finish it. And then you have to live with the chaos. So you want to move it in small bites out and into the secondary work area and work on it and complete that before you try to go get another round so that it stays manageable in your house and it doesn't overwhelm wherever you decide to work in your house. That's the last one of that. Okay. Our next topic um, comes in the form of a question. Um, I have I did not make a note of who asked this, but mm. we we get this question in 
from a lot of people in different forms. Will you, Gail, come work in Austin or Dallas or San Francisco, et cetera? <laughs> so I will actually, and I have done that. Um, the way that it changes the job is that, you know, I'm going to have to fly out and I'm going to have to um, stay in a hotel and I'm going to have to work for a certain number of days and then fly home again. And so what it means is that if you are out of town, I can't do uh, three hour appointments with you. I have to come and we have to work several days in a row all day to complete the project. And then I go home again. And so um, I have done that a few times. And um, in Dallas in particular, I went and worked with a bead friend who um, was ready to reclaim her bead space a little uh, a couple of years after her husband had died and she had not been um, focused on managing it during her grieving process, but she got to a point where she was ready to reset the room. And so we worked five days in a row for 12 hours a day. And that's a lot of organizing all at once, but it, we got the, we got the job done. And so if I had been, if it had been local, I would have tackled that in three hour blocks in a much you know, longer time frame. So um, when we come out of town, then, you know, it's going to be one of those, we're going to hit it and hit it hard and we're going to work long hours to get it all done. Uh, it just compacts the, you know, it compacts the project. If you're up for that and you're up for, uh, you know, paying for my travel expenses and it's on top of my time, I am happy to go because it's kind of fun, actually. I don't, um, not many people want to sign up for the, you know, work all day thing. And so it's fun when people do. It makes it good for me. Well, and so, but there is another option. There is another option. If you are, um, if you are looking to have a professional organizer in the United States, there is the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals. And the, that uh, website is napo.net, N-A-P-O.net. And you can go on to that website and search for find an organizer by your zip code. And so then you're getting somebody who is committed to the professional training and to the um, ethical standards that NAPO um, supports and you are getting somebody who you can go out and find their website and you can see all their details and you can get somebody within, you know, you can search 5, 10, 15, 20 miles from your location. And so that way you get people in your area uh, who can come and do like I do in your house and be helpful. And I also need to say that um, as Organizing has become a thing. Uh, it's happening all over the world. And so there are now uh, NAPO equivalent organizations in, um, where's my list? In Canada, the UK, the UK. Mm -hmm. Japan, Brazil, Italy, the Netherlands, the Republic of South Korea, and Australia. And they're growing all the time. So if you search um, professional organizers in your country or professional organizers in your city, you're likely to find, um, you'll find people who are just advertising their own business, but you'll probably also find the national organization like APTO in England and uh, Japan is J-A-L. I forget what that stands for. I'm sure it's in something Japanese, right? So <laughs> it's, uh, there are people out there doing what we do in all kinds of countries. And that way, if you find the local association um, of professionals, then you are also tapping into uh, organizers who are committed to the professional training and committed to the ethical standards of working with you and uh, honoring your privacy and being um, skilled at what they do. And those are the people that you want to try to work with in your area. So if you don't want to pay for me to come, <laughs> you can search in your area for people and they all have some version of uh, find an organizer by some kind of a um, zip code. By mailing, yeah, mail code. Right. But what if they absolutely must have the clutter fairy and they don't have the budget for that, but they've got <laughs> some budget? Then you can um, interact with me virtually. So if you, we do do virtual organizing uh, on, via the Zoom, just like we're doing now, and we schedule a one-hour appointment. It's actually 50 minutes. 
um, where you turn on your camera and I am on the camera we come in together and then you can walk me around with your camera and show me your space and we can talk about it I can give ideas and suggestions and uh, you can ask me about specific trouble spots like here I'm standing here looking at this cabinet and I don't know what to do and and so I can sort of talk you through that process and uh, hopefully give you some strategies and then you can go away and work or you can spend the hour working with me and uh, I can make suggestions as you actually work. So however you want to do it, but I'm happy to do a virtual session with you and um, it's a lot of fun. And then we record it and um, then you have access to that recording so that you can go back and watch it if you need to. So you don't have to madly take notes while we're talking or anything like that. You can see the video and go back and go, what did she say about that thing? And you can go see it again. Um, Denise commented that four, she said four of us have a mini group here where we meet up once a month and talk about decluttering. It helps us keep to our plans. And that's great. I, I think finding people who are, you know, doing the same kind of projects you're yeah. doing and supporting yeah, one another is terrific. A accountability, creating an accountability group. Sometimes you just have to say to somebody, yeah, I'm going to blah, 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 blah. And then the only thing that makes you actually do it is the fact that you have to go back next week and go, I didn't do blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> Negative reinforcement works. And, you know, having an accountability department is awesome. And moral support, right? Like it's, it's absolutely, you need somebody to help cheer you on as you accomplish small things because organizing projects are so huge and they cover such a long period of time. And it, people get discouraged because they've been working for weeks and weeks and they're not done yet. And if you're going to somebody and saying, this week I did this cabinet and they can go, yay, you know, they can be excited for you. It will help you stay motivated. So that's really fabulous, Denise. Good for you. Annie, who is watching on Facebook, commented, I really love your tacit, I've seen it all attitude because it makes me feel my own problems are within the pale. Oh, and, gosh, yes. <laughs> and I think, well, and I think that's a role that creating a support group helps fulfill as well. You, it's, it's easy to feel isolated and that there's something wrong with you or that you're that you're the worst one. You're the worst one. I, I yeah. always hear that. When people call me new and they've never had an organizer before, they some version of, I know I'm just going to be the worst person. <laughs> my favorite example of this was, uh, this is my friend Lucy who has since passed away. And she was one of my B friends. And she contacted me and she said, I need you to come and work in my garage because it's just squalor in there. She actually used the word squalor. Now, squalor to me means something very dire. And so I was like, you know, you know, girding my loins to go see the squalor. And I walked in there and it was like, there was a little pile of some stuff on the floor and there were some things on the shelves. And it was like nothing. It was the, it was so it was the easiest garage job I've done ever. And we spent, I was there for like four hours and that included a trip to Home Depot to buy shelving and come home and install it. And we still managed to get it all done. And that is in her mind, it was horrible. And in my mind, it was like, Oh my God, this doesn't even rate on the scale. <laughs> this is so not squalor by any measure possible. So we all judge ourselves very, very harshly. And we all think that it is the worst. It is got to be the worst possible one. And interacting with people about it helps you realize that we're all on the spectrum somewhere and nobody is terrible at everything. And, and we all have the same foibles and we all have the same issues and it's not as bad as you think. We always make it bigger and blacker in our own head. And, and, you know, it's very good to get out of your own head and let other people tell you what their mess is like. And that's part of why we do this group, too. It's like then you get to listen to other people say, this is my issue. This is my problem. And, of course, it's, you know, it's similar to you and it's not as bad as you think it is. And it's, yeah, we all think it's worse than it really is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So are we going to talk about um tools now yeah let's talk about your some of your favorites and um the, any any things you suggest we avoid okay so 
I, this is a silly one, but I really like to use Ziploc bags. And anytime there is a soup of small stuff, anytime that the package is irritating and doesn't work right, <laughs> anytime I'm trying to collect, you know, there's always a million binder clips in somebody's house or there's a million paper clips or there is a whole bunch of um, lipstick for instance um, I was just in somebody's house and they have a very small drawer in their bathroom where they're keeping all of their makeup and there really wasn't any kind of an organizing thing that was that she had at the moment that fit in there that it really helped and so she has ziplocked Here's the lipsticks, here's the eyeliners, here's some eyeshadows, here's the cheek stuff. Like she had ziplocked the different categories of makeup so that they could float in the drawer, but they, when she wanted lipstick, she pulled out the lipstick ziplock. And this is a way that um, it's a great thing in, in sorting crafts to keep different stuff together and it's sewing materials, anything small in a junk drawer, and the only thing that about Ziplocs is we tend to get out the gallon bag to hold, you know, two quarters worth of stuff. And then you and then the irritation is there's too much Ziploc bag. So you want to try to get creative about the sizes of Ziplocs you buy. And there are lots of, you know, they have long skinny snack size, but they've started making square snack size, too. So you can get some much smaller Ziplocs that will help you subset the contents of any drawer. And it's also a, a good temporary solution until you get the exact right organizer containers. You can Ziploc things. And I'm thinking of a pantry, for instance. Sometimes the spaces in the pantries are difficult or you open something up and you like tear something open and then you're like folding it over with a binder clip or something you're trying to. It's very annoying. And so Ziplocs allow you to repackage and seal up something that has been been open and then you can store it inside you know they it's just like any kind of loose bag you can store those ziplocs inside another container and pull that container out and fish amongst the closed containers which prevents bugs getting in moths getting in you don't have to worry about is the moth going to get past the binder clip that you're using to close up the spaghetti <laughs> so there it's a better container and so I use those all over the place. Uh, another one is an over the door shoe organizer. So that's one that hangs on the back of a door that has pockets. So sometimes it has pockets that go this way and sometimes it has um, little pockets that go to the side, but um, it's a great way to store a million things besides shoes. And it is flexible and portable so that um, if you're living in an apartment and you can't install permanent solutions somewhere, this is a way for you to have something that you can use in the apartment. And then when you move, you, un you take the thing off the wall and it goes to the next place and it's not an issue. So um, it's a great way to hang cleaning supplies up. It's great. Um, one of my friends, well, Mark, actually, our friend Mark, um, he had one hung and he used it because he's a tech guy. He had a million tech things and he used it for all the his cabling, his small electronics. And so that was a whole bunch of clear pockets, you know, 36 clear pockets or whatever, all full of tech stuff. That much tech in my house would make my head explode, but it worked for him. Um, it's great for um, uh, crafting and uh, hobby stuff. And so any place where you have a lot of small things and you want to be able to see, and as an alternative of having all those things sitting on a shelf in a cabinet or on inside a drawer on a bookshelf, if you find that you're stacking a bunch of things on a bookshelf so you can see and use them, um, consider if there's a way that you can hang a shoe organizer over a door and make use of those pockets. Um, another one is uh, now that it's spring and people are going to start hopefully running to their garage before it gets too hot. Um, a bagster is something that is available in the United States and I can't speak to whether it's available elsewhere, but a bagster is a product that is sold by waste management and it is a basically a tarp fold out bag that is very large and designed to sit on a driveway. And it is, you buy it at Home Depot or Lowe's and you pay 35 bucks or something for it. 
and it's folded up. You bring it home, you open it up when you're ready to use it, you open it up on the driveway and there's specs about um, where to put it so that you have access. Uh, the truck has access to come pick it up. But basically you unfold this tarp bag and you can fill it with anything almost practically, including construction materials and dead furniture and all kinds of, there's a little bit of, you can't put the TV, you can't put some toxic chemicals. They don't want your regular trash in, they don't want food. But you can basically clear out a garage, throw, 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 and then you go online and you schedule a pickup from the truck. And so you can fill it over a weekend. And if it's half full and on Saturday night and you go to bed and you wake up the next day and half of it's gone because people have picked it, more's the better they're just clearing space for in the bag so um it's a great way to empty out heavy things that you would normally have to wait for heavy trash day to go away or you would have to pay somebody to junk haul and drive and pay the fees to dump it in the landfill and so this way you go online you order the truck and it's you know somewhere between 130 and 160 dollars to order the truck and the truck comes with the little, you know, the arm and it picks up, there's handles on this bag and it picks up the handles and it puts it in the truck and it drives your trash away. So it is a great junk hauling solution for emptying a garage or a yard where you have a lot of weird, heavy, um, unusual equipment, broken thing, furniture, you know, the, all those large things that you have to drag to the curb for heavy trash. This is a way to make that happen when you're not and not have to wait for heavy trash. And so look into bagster.com, B-A-G-S-T-E-R.com. It is a great, and it's what I do for all kinds of jobs because I don't have a junk hauling car. <laughs> I don't have a truck with a trailer on the back. So the bagster is, you know, the single girl's version of how to empty the garage. And it's very effective. And they come right, you know, they come, you schedule the day and they come within two or three days to pick it up. And that's, and it's awesome. that cost is pretty economical um, compared yeah, you spend to, that much money for a compared person. to junk hauling. You know, I, we had a couch that we were having trouble getting rid of and I called and I, they quoted me $125 just for one to, couch. Just to carry off one couch. So that's a, a pretty good deal. If you'd done the couch into the bagster overnight, it might have disappeared before right. the baster came, right? right? Like you had to put it in there, and if it had been there for a couple of days, it might have walked off. So, a couple of comments. Um, Petra okay. said, "I love Ziploc bags. I sometimes use them in binders as well. Put some strong tape on one edge for reinforcement, then punch holes to keep them in the front of a binder." That's a great idea. That's a great way to keep up with little. You know, you want all the post-it notes and accessories to go with the paper you're using in the binder. Yeah, that's a good one. I like and that then idea. Bonnie said, "I use Ziploc bags to downsize and sort my Christmas tree ornaments. Toss the original Ooh. boxes with a flimsy film on them and place the ornaments in a box and stood up upright in sturdy containers. Easy to store and very easy to find what I'm looking for." That's a great idea. Yeah, and you know, I just got a shipment of beads for my brother-in-law who was so sweet to do that he sent me this huge amount and they were in contained uh, you know the little uh, hardware drawers that have a million little drawers in them which works until you try to ship it but so he took each of the <laughs> drawers and he wrapped it with saran wrap and put them back in and so 90 percent of it made it but then there were some drawers with in the shipping and the moving <laughs> that boss got tossed and some of the stuff came out and so there was sort of bead soup in the bottom of my drawer so it's a great way. I use them when I'm moving a lot because you can Ziploc a bunch of little bitty parts that are perfect in the box as long as the box stays upright, which it never does, right? And so Ziplocking things in a container keeps those – it survives the move better so it doesn't get all jumbled in the move. They're good okay. things. As usual, we've run over time. Can you give us ah! one one – product or organizing tool that is hyped and or oversold that you suggest people avoid? Yes, I think that um, there are a million versions of shoe trees that people sell to put in their closet. And I think people that have a whole lot of shoes try to buy those long, low to the ground shoe organizers thinking that 
one or two of them is going to hold their 200 pairs of shoes and it never <laughs> does like those things only have two or three they'll hold two or three pair on the top and underneath and if there's an individual shell maybe you'll get if you're lucky you'll get nine pairs but i think those shoe organizers they always look like they're going to be a perfect solution and then nobody translates the this thing is only going to hold six pairs of shoes but i actually have 200 pairs of shoes and so they always shortchange how many they can fit in there and how much it's going to hold and so I think it, it ends up creating more of a problem than it solves. Okay, thanks. I think we'll return to this topic again. Yes. And um, I want to remind everybody that our YouTube channel has more than 100 videos on a variety of organizing topics. And you can find that at thou.com slash YouTube. Our next meeting is next Tuesday, March 10th. And we're going to talk about self-talk for an uncluttered lifestyle. So this idea relates back to the story editing idea we talked about around the new year, how people who are collecting clutter talk about it and uh, how we the can kinds of talk things they differently say to for, yeah, and the things you could say to yourself to try and uh, change your habits. So right. Just a teaser awesome. on that. Um, one more comment on from Facebook that I wanted to share. Patricia okay. said, hi from dark, cold, drizzle, damp Vancouver. <laughs> I'm I, sorry it's cold there. Thank, thanks so very much. I may have listened to every video of yours during yoga, et cetera, and have come a long way. Any tips for those with seasonal affective disorder, SAD? And I think we'll, we're not going to talk about that now, but we'll maybe talk about that and organizing with one. other with in other with other psychological uh situations and complications okay. for a future issue i need to have a little do a little research on that too my mother um yeah my mother had issues with seasonal affective disorder and it made her very depressed and so really what's happening is that um the the response is you're you get depressed which then makes it hard for you to do stuff and it makes it hard for you to focus and all that stuff and so it's really how to keep going when you are um focusing on um when you're trying to get out of sort of a, a dark space and so we'll we can talk about that please everybody keep the keep the comments and topics coming um they're helping us so much. Yeah. If you're watching on YouTube, we'd love for you to join us live to get notifications about upcoming events. Join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook. And you can subscribe to our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. You can give us your questions and topic suggestions in the YouTube comments or any of the other channels I've mentioned, or visit our website at clutterfairyhouston.com. Thanks, you guys. It was so great to talk to you. I appreciate you um, joining us again, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.